Kalaronai Bakar, Kalaronai Beadar, Kalaronai Shavera Razim, by Shavera Dona et Raze Havanon, Yakinik Megabon Vesirian Kemo Ben Ramim, Kalaronai Hotze Lavotesh, Kalaronai of Emeba, Yakila Dona Mibakadesh, Kalaronai Hole Layalot, Er Sophia Rehol Kolo or Megabot. Adonai la mabun ya asha ma yeshev Adonai melech leolam Adonai oz li amo yitain Adonai varech et amo vashalom And we go and put the Torah in Uvnu cho yom ha'ashem Eit ha'ayim hi lama chazikim ba Vetom cheha meusha Derocheha nachenam Vechon etivoteha shalom Ashi veheinu Adonai Elecha venashuva Hadesh Hadesh yameinu Hadesh yameinu Kekedem And you may be seated. Thank you, Marcella. Okay. So please be seated. I'm going to do my study unit now and then we'll finish up Aleinu and Enkelaheinu and the happy, happy theme. Um, go to share screen here and pull up my topic for today, uh, which is continuing in my theme of great Jewish thinkers, great Jewish minds are coming into the modern age. And how did we get the Jewish world that we have as it is today, uh, primarily in the United States, primarily in the United States. <clears throat> which is a consequence of what happened, as I spoke last week, by this little guy by the name of Moses Mendelssohn, who opened the gates of Europe to Jews and opened the gates of... Uh, of... Good, good, good. What is my phone doing? Hold on. Okay, good. I love these phones that turn on themselves. Yeah. I'll... Sorry. Good. Oh boy. All right. Silence. Technology. Oh. Okay. <laughs> you know, you know what they say is in technology, technology is perfect, but garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have the right input, that's what you're going to get. So, anyway, we have what is called a in Marxist thought and in Hegelian thought, it was called the dialectic. Any of you ever took your political science classes? Uh, in Marx, in particular, it's a very formal form that we've got, except we have a thesis, which is the situation, which is, in Marxist thing, economics. Then you have the antithesis, which is the reaction to that. And then you have the synthesis, which is a response, which creates a new thesis, and you go on again and again. And in Marx, it is economic systems, agrarian to uh, feudal to mercantile to the capitalist and to the ultimate to the working class, the proletarian. <clears throat> but Marx took it from thinkers like Hegel, whom not economics, but the idea is what takes shape. Our collective grounds of thought, the way we think. And Hegel said in history, we've got cycles, but the cycles go forward. Like we go from, in particular, he's talking about freedom from absolute dictatorship of the Pharaoh moving towards the breakdown of the feudal societies to the beginnings of early um, uh, democratic societies in Europe down to, in his idea, the ideal Prussian state of his day where it was a monarch, but you had a parliament and so on. So devolution of power to the people. So this is the kind of thinking that's going on. So we have this response. So there's a scholar, Jewish scholar sitting in Galicia by the name of Rabbi Nachman Krochmal. And he's looking at these and he's saying, why is it that, yeah, okay, the Egyptians came and went, the Romans came and went, everybody else came and went. How come we're still around? <clears throat> because we should have disappeared. I mean, that's the general consensus of historians until modern times. We should have disappeared, but we didn't. Why not? Why not? And he said, well, it's not like we think that we've always been exactly the same since the time of Moses, but rather that we have been constantly rising to challenges and creating new adaptations to those challenges and those have been successful and they move us on to the next stage. He called his book More Nebuche Hazman, like Rambam, Maimonides, Guide for the Plex, Perplex of Our Time. 
So he's talking about, let's look at really what have we been doing? We have been reacting. There's a thesis is what is this? There's an antithesis and we have a new synthesis. We move on and, and develop. We're not frozen. And then he asked the book not to be printed in his lifetime because he thought it would be too controversial in the Jewish community in Galicia was printed after that. Well, Moses at Mendelssohn, it was before this fellow, the end of the 1700s, right? This is a phase of shock for the Jews. Gates of Berlin are open. So what then, what's the response of the Jewish world? It's not just in Europe. It takes time, but it goes, a few decades later, it is like Krachmal, a few decades later into Galicia and into Poland and into the Ukraine. It takes a long time, not a long time, the delay of decades, maybe hundreds. In, in the Jews of North Africa and the Middle East also, all of these ideas, reason, nationalism, human rights, they're taking root in the Turkish world, in the Arab world, is beginning to get some kind of conscious, national consciousness, and in the Jewish world, also in the Middle East, where we see among the Mizrahi Jewry also the same impact. Uh, it's not as pronounced there because to some great extent, they were not as cut off from the, their world as the European Jews were, right? And also their, 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 their approach to Allah is not as extreme. You talk to any Sephardic rabbi and you get a much better answer than you get from an Ashkenazic rabbi, very simple. So the shock was not as great there either. Now, so Jews are giving this up. Do we want civil rights? <clears throat> and you say, yeah, we'll jump for it. Napoleon, who opened uh, the gates of uh, one of the ghettos uh, in Italy, <clears throat> he's looking at the Jewish community. He gathers a great Sanhedrin and he asks the question, are you Jews French or not? I have 12 questions for you. It's a long list of them. Will you marry our women? All right? That's one of the great questions. And, and so on. But the main questions, the really concerned questions are, in the eyes of Jews, are Frenchmen not of the Jewish religion considered as brethren or strangers? Are you willing to be brothers with us? Number one. Number two, what conduct does Jewish law prescribe towards Frenchmen not of the Jewish religion? Will you apply the same rules to us as you apply to yourselves? Number three, do Jews born in France, treated by the law as French citizens, acknowledge France as their country? Are they bound to defend it? Are they bound to obey laws and follow directions of the civil code? This is very important because this is a precedent for all minorities everywhere around the world. We're setting it up. Okay, civil rights. If, you're, if we're going to consider you brothers, are you going to act as brothers? We want to know. That is not true today in many parts of the world. Right? A lot of this fell apart. But that's the precondition for civil society. So their response... I said, well, we're not going to marry your daughters because we marry within our religion. Okay, fine. But <clears throat> every Israelite is religiously bound to consider his non-Jewish fellow citizen as brothers and to aid, protect, and love them as though they were co-religionists. That the Israelite is required to consider the land of his birth or adoption as his fatherland shall love and defend it when called upon. In World War I, when Jews were on both sides of the line in World War I, on the French side and the German side, the French Jews were fighting for France, the German Jews were fighting for Germany. When they had a ceasefire, they got together, got a minion for the dead, and they went back, right? I mean, this is Dina de Melchuta Dina. This is actually reenacting what was a classic Jewish position. Whatever country we're in, we accept the laws of that country. We are loyal to that country. Our job is not to overturn and make that country Jewish. We are not out for jihad. We are not out for mass conversion to the, to the one faith. Uh, Christian, Muslim, doesn't matter. That's not our job, right? And that set the precedent for us. So now, Jews asked the question though, opening the gates, wait a minute, it's a little nerve wracking. So when Napoleon invaded Russia, there was a great debate in Eastern Europe. Is Napoleon the Messiah? He's opening the gates for us. Or is he Gog and Magog is the, the anti-Messiah? because he's going to smash up our Jewish institutions. A great debate in, in East Europe among the Hasidim, for example. Rabbi Nachman of Bratzla thought this was really the, the end of days. Napoleon was the rebirth of some great tzaddik, some great noble soul. And uh, they said that the Hasidim could see the image of the Rabbi of Nemirov uh, standing beside Napoleon during his battles in their visions. On the other hand, 
most of these European Jewish leaders, including the founder of Chabad, Rabbi Schneerson, the original Schneerson, you know, Zalman, oppose the French ruler. We are, right, we are under the Tsar, we are loyal to the Tsar. But not only that, we're afraid that opening the gates will open up Jews to contamination. To the ideals of the French Revolution, the wrong way. So we'd rather stay within our shtetl, within our ghetto, because that's the only way we will survive. So two responses. Okay, so now that becomes by the way, a novel by Martin Buber, uh, Gogo Mago, considered one of his best books. So what kind of response do we have to the opening of the West? Well, we can go and we can reject the ideas of the West. We don't have to reject citizenship, but we can reject the ideas. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to say, I'm going to give you a very bad example. I'm going to give you a very bad example. When a dog, you have a dog as a pet in the house. If you have a cage for that dog, the dog gets used to the cage. You open the cage, the dog walks right in. Security. So we're forcing the ghetto. On the other hand, it gave us security. So it's a two-way street. Two-way street. So rejection. So rejection is right, right? You, this is a, an intellectual movement. Hadash asur min Torah. That which is new is forbidden already in the Torah. Already, Moses already forbade the organ. Moses already forbade the mixed seating. Right? He already forbade it. Uh, leading figures, Hatam Sofer. Hatam Sofer and uh, Rabbi Kiva Iger, for example. This is Central Europe and some other extent Eastern Europe. Hatam Sofer, um, anybody know anybody by the name of Schreiber? Generally, they're descendants of the Hatam Sofer. Sofer in Hebrew, a scribe. Hatam, he signs as a scribe, that's his name. And a scribe in Hebrew is Schreiber. So you meet people named Schreiber, they're generally descendants. He's from Frankfurt, my birth town. Okay, that's the claim to fame. He established himself in what was Pressburg, which is now Bratislava in Slovakia, then it was Hungarian territory. And the slogan, that which is new, was already forbidden in the written Torah. And his job, he said, it was to make a no holds barred attack, no concessions to modernity. All right, it was very strong. He put pumped effort and resources into education, into better schooling, better yeshivas. He made sure that his best students were appointed to uh, rabbinic positions wherever he could to act as a barrier wall against the encroachment of modernity. Right? And so he put this breach, a very powerful breach between the Orthodox and non-Orthodox sectors. And one of his things was to stop the war between the Hasidim and the Misnagdim, the Hasidic community was considered by the establishment rabbis as rebellious. And I said, wait a minute, we're both rebelling against the same thing, against this loyalty to God. We're on the same wavelength. That war was finally put to bed. It was a vicious war. The Rebbe of Chabad, the first founder of Chabad, was put into jail by his opponents, right? That war is ended. We're now together putting up the breach against modernity. So he dissociated himself from the battle of emancipation. So we should not be rushing to be citizens with all the equal rights. Equality is a sign of dissatisfaction with our role as a community and as Jews. It's a desire for assimilation into the Gentile culture, right? And if you had secular education, it was only as much as needed for trade or profession, not beyond that. A claim to fame, so he married, uh, the, he, he married the daughter of the greatest Talmudist of his day, Rabbi Kiva Eger, that's my mother's mother's great grandfather. Okay, now I give you my yechis. Okay, put this picture up there. Okay, the other route. The other route was reform, which was could one be a Jew and a member of European civilization without being a Christian? Now, I mean, one route was since Christians were no longer such Christians, one could be a Christian. Heinrich Heine did it, Karl Marx's father did it, Benjamin Disraeli's father did it. Okay, no difference anyway. We're still Jews in the eyes of the Gentiles, but we, we can get into law school. Uh, by the way, this was true till uh, in South America, till recent times. I have a friend who, he and his brother grew up in Argentina. Uh, he wanted to be an engineer, wanted to go into engineering school, but to do that, you had to go through the Air Force, but the Air Force was only to Catholics in Argentina, open only to Catholics, 
could not go to engineering school, so they end up in the United States as a solution. Right? So that's even in our times. So what was changing? Oh, yeah, one could be, and here's the push, return to prophetic Judaism, the prophets only, because the Christians like the prophets too. It doesn't distinguish us from Christians. It reunites us with Christians. One would be a Jew of the Mosaic persuasion. Deutsche Mosaicus Glaubens. Right? There's still today, by the way, in Sacramento, conservative congregation, the synagogue of Mosaic law. Right? That term Mosaic. So it began with baby steps in uh, Germany, uh, decorum in the synagogue. People weren't going to run around anymore. The sermon would be given in German. Service was a, a bridge short. It was not big steps, not big steps. But then they went further. In Hamburg, that was the first big one, the temple there. They removed the prayers for return to Zion. We are Germans. Well, there's no such thing as Germany yet. You know, there is, uh, there's Hessen and there's Bavaria and there's Prussia, but okay, we're all of those. And uh, there's the introduction of the organ. And not yet complete abandonment of halacha, but it comes. Women were still in the balcony. Not until the move of German Jews in the 1840s. You know, the German, there was a tremendous rebellion in Germany, revolution uprising that failed in the 1840s. German Jews, a lot of German Jews fled. That became the basis for the new Jewish community uh, that was heavily Germanized in the 1840s. And that gave rise to American reform. And the women moved to the balcony because this, there was a fire in the building that they were using and they moved into a church and there was no balcony in the church. Rabbi Isaac Mayer Weiss, it was an accident and it stuck. But in Germany, there still were balconies. So for example, my father's synagogue where he served as the first state rabbi uh, had the largest, it's the second largest pipe organ in Germany. There you can see a picture of the choir and the pipe or the pipes, huge pipes behind them. And still, it's not, an, it's not there anymore because the community has become orthodox. All the liberal Jews were killed off by Hitler or escaped and they were replaced by East European refugees. Uh, and so the balcony, though, is still there. This has been refurbished, but there's the women's balcony. That, that is in use, right? As I said, it's now an orthodox synagogue. Well, prime figure here uh, in this figure, Rabbi Avram Geiger, Avram Geiger. Uh, he became a rabbi in Breslau. Breslau is a part of Poland that became Germany when they swamped, yeah. fired up the, uh, the country and it disappeared, basically. So in Breslau, he established a school for religious studies and active in the synods. There were councils that were uh, getting together in 1845 and 1846. And it was these synods that enacted uh, decisions that led the more orthodox Jews including his friend, Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, to separate from the reformers. So we'll talk about them later. So they set out to eliminate from Judaism every mark of national uniqueness. So the goal was to live a lifestyle that brought holiness into the modern world, but it would be a world of science and truth. So all the outmoded rabbinic legislation had to be re-examined on the basis of reason, morality, and modernity to be acceptable. So if a practice separated the Jew from the modern world, there was the obligation to renounce that practice. You would no longer dress like a Jew. You no longer eat like a Jew. You no longer worship maybe like a Jew, right? All of Jewish tradition was an evolutionary process. And each generation had to create an expression that enacted ethical, eternal ethical laws of Judaism. All right, so you don't need the kosher. You get rid of the kippah and the talit and the tefillin because those are accoutrements that we don't need. And the references to Zion, it's taken out. The reference to a personal Messiah, reference to the resurrection of dead removed. Uh, references to the sacrifice removed. And he almost tried to get rid of the prayer in Hebrew, but there he couldn't convince them to get rid of Hebrew completely. And they also almost got rid of circumcision, but they kept that too. The second things they don't touch. Okay, you don't go down there. And then... What, what's left? <laughs> that's it. Now then... <laughs> That, that this anti-circumcision move is big now. It's coming up big now. So anyway, um, they believed in this with a messianic passion. It wasn't just that they were looking for an easy way in. They really believed in the ideals of the Enlightenment, of the European Enlightenment, of what's called the early liberal society. Uh, they believed they would save Judaism from stagnation. And, and to some extent, they were right because what, is, what they had been left with, it was this kind of rejectionist, uh, stiff, orthodoxy or stiff 
unbendingness, right? So they were going to save Jews from it. Well, guess what? Not all Jews like that idea, including the great friend of Rabbi Geiger, Rabbi Samson Frel Hirsch. So we call what, what's called neo-Orthodox, the renewed orthodoxy. So Europe, it's in light with the European thoughts. Uh, European re- rationalism also had gone overboard. Any of you remember who are the great poets of English uh, literature of the 19th century, Byron and Shelley? So they are the romantics. Romanticism was returned to the heart, returned to the emotions, returned to the imagination. And this was going through Germany, and Jews were affected by that. Pure reason is not satisfactory. It doesn't give us food. And so we have, for example, this movement, Rabbi Sassam Raphael Hirsch, founder of the Perushim. Perushim, the Pharisees. Pharisees meaning Horesh. I separate myself now from the rest of the community. The community has gotten lost. I'm going to be correct. I'm not going to be rejectionist, but I'm not going to get caught up by the rest of the crowd. So we can't stomach the reforms. They got the local government to give them political recognition. Remember that in Europe, the church is a government institution. You have a Gemeinde, Kultusgemeinde, your religious entity. So the church state has to recognize it. They got separate recognition from the rest of the Jewish community. And they combined modern culture and education with an ironclad adherence to Jewish law. So he went along with the Roman some days, right? He wore clerical robes, had a choir male only, shaved his beard, before there were electric chairs, which means he was using something like a blade, delivered sermons in German, encouraged study of the Bible, as opposed to emphasizing Talmud. Back to the Bible. And it got rid of even Kol Nidre, because he said, look, it is uh, not authorized by the Talmud. It uh, creates confusion. So this is the young Rabbi Hirsch. You can see here, where's his yarmulke? It's his wig, the perika, the wig. And when he was invited to come to the uh, Kaiser to greet him, he bowed down to him, it is said, uh, without any hat covering, because that's not appropriate, but he was wearing his wig. And he said, the wig is a head covering. Therefore, it's fine. Right? Tormid Dera Heretz, that is their theme. Torah, together with the ways of the world, the secular world. Uh, In the context of Mishnah, Dera Heretz means work. But he meant engagement with Western culture while maintaining adherence to the Torah. Great balance, very difficult balance. He created the idea of the Yisrael mensch, Israel mensch, the Jew, the decent Jew, the upstanding Jew, right? An enlightened religious personality. So you could do non-halachic changes, superficial changes, but you wouldn't touch the existence, the core of Jewish belief or halacha. Uh, Here we go, 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 yeah. You're talking about today. Uh, I sort of your your inner out, not yet. You you have to be, you still have to be identified with something. Otherwise, you were with the socialists. You would be with the socialists, or you would be with the Bundists, right? So you would be one of those movements, later Zionists. Yeah. So that would be the social national, but more towards uh, East Europe, more towards East Europe. Huh? Germany, to some extent, but the big movement is in East Europe. That's where you get it. That's why, where you get uh, the two leaders after Lenin of the Soviet Revolution. You've got Trotsky, and those three. So now you have a Kamenev, right? There you get it. All right, so his most famous work, 19 Letters of Benoziel. There he is a little bit older. Um, a letter from a rabbi to a young intellectual, and he talks about the challenges of emancipation, and sets up the key elements of God, man, and Jewish history, discussion of mitzvot, classifications, was very, very popular book in its day. And they, this modern Orthodox camp would have its own rabbinical seminary in Berlin, the Hildesheimer Rabbinical Seminary, Rabbiner Seminar für das Orthodoxe Judentum in Berlin. Uh, afterwards, 
is his son-in-law took over. And if any of you have ever lived in Manhattan, I don't know if they're still active or not, but the upper west side of Manhattan, as you go towards uh, Washington Heights, heavily German Jews, that is Breuer's Gemeinde. And they're, still, they're still speaking German for, for a long time. They're, came, they're the ones who came right before and after Hitler settled there. Uh, and still had, you know, and you could identify them because they all dressed very well went to the opera, were educated, highly educated, but very meticulously observant. Right? So that's one of the reactions. Then you've got the academic reaction. Wissenschaft by itself, just academics. And one of the reform, reformers, Leopold Zunz, who, whose function, he said, was mainly to examine using modern academic methods the study of Jewish sources, Bible, Talmud, Midrash, philosophy, and halakha, and examine sources the way academicians study sources, the way scientists study bacteria, we're going to study Judaism. And it was very important because we did get rid of a lot of cobwebs. However, he is remembered as the scholar who said the task of Jewish study is to provide the remnants of Judaism with a decent burial. In other words, many of them felt this was the end of Judaism, that with the opening of the gates of Europe, Jews would vanish. And so we want to at least do honor to the traditions before we blend in and was attacked by very later on by great Jewish uh, thinkers. Uh, Gershom Shalom, for example, he considered them grave diggers. Okay. So, but this word Wissenschaft, my father's rabbinical school, Hochschule für die Wissenschaft des Judentums, the Academy for the Scientific Study of Judaism. Right? It was what we might call liberal, progressive, it was under Rabbi Leo Beck in my father's time, but it also included orthodox scholars as well as uh, critical scientific scholars, you may say. So, middle road, there's always a middle road, right? You take the high road, and I'll take the road, and I'll take the middle road in between. There's always gonna be a middle road. I say thesis, synthesis, antithesis. Oh, uh, sorry, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. That's it, boom, 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 boom. It's a middle road, which said, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's what's now called conservative Judaism is today called positive historical school. Positive historical? Why, why historical? We accept that there is an analysis of development of Judaism. We can study analytically and critically, but positive, we are looking positively at the traditions and the heritage that we have. We're not going to abandon them. We're going to study why and how and see what needs to be done based on that study. We're not going to be rejectionists. We're not going to be frozen in halakha. We're not carrying out the baby with the bathwater to do it. So big, big figure here is Zacharias Frankel, chief rabbi of Dresden, uh, for a proponent of maybe what might be called moderate reform, but he broke with his radical colleagues in 1845 on the issue of Hebrew language uh, as the language of prayer. Very interesting in the United States, where was the break between the conservative and the reform in 1880? where they established the Hebrew Union College, union meaning they were gonna bring the reformers and the traditionalists together. And at the college, somebody forgot to tell the waiters not to bring out the shrimp. And at that point, the traditionalists walked out. And that's where, right? Hey, okay, you, what you do at home is your job. On my, at, at the rabbinical school, at the opening? Okay, that's how, you, you gotta watch what you cook. So, huh? No, it's more, more, it's, it's more unkosher than the pig. Okay, so this is the big fight. He called for positive historical Judaism, right? The positive side, the ceremonial substance of Jewish practice while allowing for moderate change and an attitude of respect for the historical nature of Judaism. We're responding, we're developing, responding. So the loyalty of generations of the past has weight as much as a proof text from a authoritative source and the needs of the community today. So he established also, notice each one has a rabbinical school. So is the form the, to a great extent, the, the Wissenschaft school, whereas the Hildesheimer and Breslau, 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 Yudische Theologische Seminar, right? This is the word seminary rather than yeshiva, indicating this uh, attempt to be academic in its approach. There's one in Vienna also using that term, but the big one was in Breslau. So uh, they trained the, what was the conser a classic historic conservative uh, movement in Europe. So what we've got here in the United States is an outcome of what happened in Germany in the 1800s. So by the way, today in Germany, 
there is an Abraham Geiger rabbinical school, because all the institutions were wiped out by the, the Nazis. So there's an Abraham Geiger rabbinical school, which is a reform in Berlin, and there's a Harris Frankel rabbinical school, conservative, a friend of mine is running it now. Um, there are some Orthodox schools also. All of these completely new, the, the original community wiped out. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so what you had was, and again, um, taking the text of the prayer book, retaining the Matbeer Shel the format of the prayer, here and there adjusting and adopting for the conservative prayer book as we have it is the is the outgrowth of it right so we did not remove the prayers for the return to zion we did not remove the idea of a messiah messiah from it we uh, did not remove the references to uh, resurrection of the day we did not remove it. we retranslate sometimes didn't remove it we made some technical adjustments so um where it comes to the sacrifices we recall the sacrifice instead of praying to renew the sacrifice. Slight technical adjustment. Otherwise, the format is the same. Hebrews retained as the core of the service. Kashrut, some technical adjustments in Kashrut. So you generally accept to eat dairy in restaurants, for example. We're not going to be so picky. Um, cheeses, again, these are more superficials. Use of wines, more superficials. But still, general idea that the commitment to Jewish observance is still at the core. Rather than accepting a certain set of beliefs, right? Mendelssohn was saying, we, 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 don't, we, we don't have any beliefs. We just have an observance, right? As a, and their Orthodox Jews have followed that. No, we're going to say, wait, we have our observances and we have some core uh, historic beliefs that we can count or call on. So that would be a description. Now, it, obviously in America, the 20th century, the 21st century, the lines become blurred. Things that the conservatives did, the reform adopted. Things that the reform did, the conservatives adopted. Things that both of our movements did, the orthodox adopted. Uh, so there is, there's obviously a lot of back and forth among the movements. And today, to some extent, uh, at least between the reform and conservative reconstructions, the lines are tend, uh, more blurred than they were. Yeah, and uh, probably there's going to be some kind of merging. I don't know if it'll be really merging, but or a blending of the approaches. But then when you got Jews, you got to have two or three opinions anyway. So I don't see them disappearing as separate movements. Okay, so that's it. My, so we move on to, that's, that's how we get to where we are in the Jewish world. Yeah, coming back to our days, uh, we have several very wonderful people in the Yeah, a million, a million. New age, 